pray and get into the Word this morning. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your Word, which is the truth. We do receive your Word, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you for all that you're going to accomplish through your Word this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. Today we're going to begin a series of messages on the subject of faith. Faith is very important for us, as we will see from the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We can't please God without faith. Therefore, we need to understand faith. We need to walk by faith and do what He says. He that cometh to God must believe that He is, and He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We also realize from Matthew in chapter 23, in verse 23, he says this, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. The weightier was those that were more important. This really means, when you study this out, not what they put here. It really means more important when you look it up in some of the Greek lexicons the more important matters of the law, which were judgment, mercy, and faith. They even considered these things important, even though faith is hardly mentioned at all in the Old Testament. Only a couple times is actually the word faith because it's a New Testament thing in Jesus Christ now. These ought you have to have done and not to leave the other undone. They were doing all these other things instead of focusing on the things that were more important to the Lord. Also, it's important that we are operating in faith at all times, as we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, it says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. That means we need to be sure we're in the faith. He says, prove your own selves. Just because we're born again doesn't mean we're in the faith, that we're operating by faith. So it's very important that we take a look at faith. And we're going to answer a lot of questions as we go along. You know, what does God say about faith? And why is faith important? We need to look at that. What is faith? We need to understand what it is. Who has faith? And the question is, do you have faith? And if you do, what, what, what do you have? We need to understand that. What do I do with the faith that I have? And what will faith accomplish for you? Where is faith? Because the Bible talks about where faith is. Who can use faith? And when do I get this faith? And how does faith come? And how does it work in my life? What is faith to be in? It is to be in something. Does the Father expect us to use our faith? Also, do we have enemies against the faith? And what hinders your faith? And just because you're a born-again Christian, are you always automatically in faith? And obviously we know, even from this scripture, that we're not necessarily in faith. Am I in faith when I'm just believing in God? As a lot of people say, well, I just believe in God. Does that mean you're in faith necessarily? And this, remember the scripture says, the devils believe and they tremble. Well, they're not in good shape. There's more than just believing, isn't it? Is faith working for me when I say, I am believing God for such and such a promise? That's what I hear people say. I've heard it for years and years and years. They always say, well, I'm believing God for such and such. And that's all they got to say. And they're not seeing the promises. Well, why not? Because faith will bring forth the manifestation of promises, the things that we must understand. Also, can one depart from the faith? We need to take a look at scriptures on that. And can your faith be lacking just because you are in Christ? Most people think that faith is just believing in God or I'm believing for something and that everything will just ought to work out. And they think that God's just in control of everything and everything's just all up to God. We already saw that and we talked about the fact that God's not in control of all things because the devil's out there working. So it's important that we understand about faith. Why is faith important? We see the fact, even in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talking about faith, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. These things are supposed to abide in us and remain in us. They should be major things in our life. Of course, faith is the most important, but faith and charity is the most important, which is love, but faith and hope are vitally important for us as well. In fact, we look at the scriptures thinking about why faith is important. We see it covers really every aspect of our life. And if we just kind of run through some of these scriptures, you see in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are you saved through faith. So salvation comes through faith. How about the Holy Spirit? 
Is the Holy Spirit just received just because God decides to give the Holy Spirit to you? No. Galatians 3, 14. The blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive, lambano, take unto us, the promise of the Spirit through faith. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? With your faith. How about as far as who are the ones who are righteous before God? The ones who are righteous before God are those who are operating in faith. Here it says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, there's no difference. Righteousness comes forth by faith. We also see that we are sanctified. We are made holy through our faith, acting upon God's word. We see this in Acts 26, 18, where the gospel comes forth to open our eyes, to turn us from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. We are sanctified or made holy through our faith. We also see the fact that God's Word declares that you and I are the children of God by faith, not just because of the fact that we believe in God, but because we have received Him. We are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, the grace of God came through Jesus Christ, but does that mean that the grace of God is automatically working in our life? The Bible says in verse Romans 5, 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, or we have stood, literally it says. In other words, by faith, that's how you have access into the grace, to be able to come into the favor of God. See, the favor of God has conditions, and one of them is the fact that you come into it, access to it through walking in line with the way of faith. And of course, we see that faith is a walk. That means it's a step-by-step -step thing in our life. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight, or that which is revealed to the senses by those things in the natural realm. We also see that not only do we walk by it, it's, a, it's the way we live. This is your way of life. In Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 38, the Bible says this, now the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. If we don't live by faith, God does not have pleasure in us. So it's important that we live by faith. We also see the fact that we are, get victory through our faith. Over in 1 John, in chapter 5, in verse 4, we know what the Bible says that whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The only way you're going to overcome the world and all the things that are in there, in this world system dominated by the devil, is through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We already saw the scripture about how we please God with our faith. We can't please Him any other way, as it said in Hebrews 11:6. We also see the fact that we are kept, we're going to be kept, protected, kept and guarded, as this means, in 1 Peter 1, 5, by the power of God, through faith. Otherwise, the power of God's going to go into operation to keep you and guard you. And how's it come into operation? Through your faith. You're going to put it into operation in your life. Ephesians chapter 3, over in verse 12, it talks about how we have access. And in the context here, it's talking about in the heavenly places, how it might be known the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Through Christ we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith. We can enter into the realm of the Spirit, we can take dominion over the spirits in the heavenlies, and we can destroy their works. Every work of the enemy that comes against you, the only way you're going to be able to be successful against it is not by just trying to deal with it in the flesh, but no, we're going to deal with our faith in the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. All means all. We have to get the shield of faith and hold that shield of faith up to deal with every attack of the enemy. We also see that when we operate by faith, we'll be able to stand and we won't fall in our life. You know, God will keep us from falling. Romans 11:20 says, Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. You and I stand firm and steadfast and victorious by our faith. Praise God. 
We also know the fact that every mountain in your life, every mountain, anything that is a hindrance or a blockage to you, it can be removed. Mark 11, 23, I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. This is your faith in operation, because he said, Have faith in God. This is actually a mistake in the King James as far as in God. It actually, the word in God is in the genitive in the Greek, and it literally means have the faith of God. As Young says, have the faith of God. Otherwise, we're supposed to have the faith of God, and what do we do with it? We speak to the mountain, and we put that mountain out of the way. Also, we can pray a prayer of faith. Whatsoever we make a demand of what's due us, we, we pray, we believe that we take hold of them, and we'll have them. We can pray a prayer of faith that will bring forth the promises of God in our life. And we know that we can be healed through our faith. There's scripture after scripture after scripture in the New Testament showing how their faith made them whole. We see an example here over in Mark chapter 5, talking about the woman with the issue of blood. He said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. We see the same thing happening with blind, blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, down here in verse 52. He says, Go thy way. Thy faith, thy faith hath made thee whole. Your faith can make you whole. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. See, as we get our faith developed and we walk in the true faith, we can see God bring forth healing and restoration. And there were time after time where faith brought forth healing in the scriptures. One of the things we got to realize, faith is one of the mysteries in the Word of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 9, it says this, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Notice it. It calls it one of the mysteries. One of the mysteries are those things that are, that are hidden, that are secret, essentially, divine secrets that are hidden from those that are not, of course, walking in line with the way of faith. It is a mystery. So God wants to give the revelation of the mystery of faith unto us, and he will do that. In fact, we know in Mark chapter 4, in verse 11, that it is promised to us. He says this, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables. They won't know. God wants everyone to know the mysteries, the mystery of the kingdom, and that would include the mystery of faith, so we can understand it. Another thing we must realize is that many people think they're operating faith. They say, well, I believe my way and you believe your way and all these kind of things. Well, wait a minute. Are there a whole lot of different faiths out there? No, not according to God's word. Ephesians 4, verse 5 says there's one faith. One faith. You're either in it or you're not. One way or the other. As it says, one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. All these things, there's one. And it's talking about a spiritual faith that is going to produce. In fact, we even see further down in Ephesians 4, where it talks about the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, what was their purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all, this is all Christians, come in the unity of the faith. God wants us all to come to the unity of the faith, the one faith, and we're walking in the way of faith so that we can grow up, says also the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now the devil, of course, tries to pervert the faith and get people off of the true faith. And there's all kinds of things out there today that purport to be the real faith, but they're not in line with the Word. In fact, we see in Philippians 1.27, he says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel. Striving for the faith of the gospel. That meant the fact that they had to really kind of work and seek after to walk in the true faith with one mind. It means they had to guard their mind. Our mind is to have, of course, to be the mind of Christ. In fact, we even see a scripture down in Jude, in verse 3, 
where they were dealing with all kinds of problems coming against the true faith. Here he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. See, a lot of things were coming into the church which were contrary to faith, contrary to the true faith. He said, you should earnestly contend for this faith because the enemy was coming against and trying to pervert the true faith. Also, as we operate in faith, we're going to have to learn to fight, a spiritual fight, a good fight. As it says in 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. It is a spiritual fight, a contest against adversaries that are trying to lead you away from the true faith. Anytime anybody can get you off the Word of God and follow the traditions of men, you're not following the true faith. Anytime they can get you to compromise on the things of the Word of God, then we're not following the true faith either. We've got to fight to follow the good, fighting the good fight of faith so we're truly following the way of the Lord. And that is so important. In fact, it's even quite a statement that Jesus makes when he talks about when he comes back what is Jesus going to be looking for when he comes back on earth, comes back to earth to catch the church to meet the to catch the church up to meet him in the air? Luke 18:8 it says, "I tell you, he'll avenge them speedily." It's talking about how he avenged us against from the enemies against us. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? He's going to be looking for faith. He's going to be looking for people that are walking in faith and and really following the true faith of the Lord Jesus. In fact, this word when is really an emphatic word, the way this particular one, it's an interrogative particle, implies anxiety or impatience on the part of the questioner. In a sense, it wasn't, Jesus wasn't anxious, but it's really talking about an emphatic type of a word. He was very emphatic. Hey, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? I mean, it's a very emphatic statement that he made. This wasn't some off-the-cuff statement. Very emphatic because he wants to see people, if they're walking in faith or not. So it's very important. We must understand, first of all, what happens to you when you get born again. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, what do you get? You get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. And what do you get with that? You also get the faith of Jesus Christ that comes to you at the time of the new birth. I've had many people over the years say, I want you to pray for me to have faith. Say, well, I'm not going to pray for you to have faith because there's no scripture to pray for you to have faith. You've got to understand what happened to you when you got born again and what you have, and then you've got to learn what says in order to develop and increase and strengthen your faith, not to pray for you to get faith or to pray to you to have more faith. Instead, it's doing what's necessary so that our faith will develop, as you'll see. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, in our physical body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. How could we live by the faith of the Son of God unless we had the faith of the Son of God? You could, God would never tell you to live by something if you didn't have it. And whose faith is it? Is it your faith? No. Notice, it's the faith of the Son of God, which means the faith that you have is the faith of Jesus Christ. You get the faith of Jesus Christ when you are born again. And that is important to realize. We even see in Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 2, it makes this statement. Looking unto Jesus, the author, he is the author and finisher, which means developer or perfecter of our faith. He's the author of our faith. So whose faith is it? It is the faith of Jesus Christ. And you have it. How did you get it? when you're born again. So what do I have that is the faith of Jesus Christ that I got when I'm born again? It's important that we understand what faith is. Faith is a spirit. Faith is that which is a spirit. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, We having the same spirit of faith. You have a spirit of faith. So when you got Jesus, received Jesus, your personal Lord and Savior, you not only got the spirit of Jesus Christ, but you also got a spirit of faith. And notice, we have the same spirit of faith. 
Every one of us got the same spirit of faith. So don't ever think, I don't have faith. That's a lie. If you're born again, you got faith. What, what is your faith? Is it a feeling? No. Is it a mindset? No. It is a spirit. You have a spirit of faith. You are going to live by this general spirit of faith. And notice it's the same faith. Same spirit as everybody else has. We even see this pointed out in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. We have like precious faith. Your faith is the same as my faith as well as everybody else's faith. The same like precious spirit of faith. Now, when it talks about the faith that you have, everybody has been given the measure of faith. So don't think that you don't have enough faith. You got faith. The problem is not having enough faith. The problem is what you've done with your faith. Romans 12, 3, I say, through the grace given unto me, every man that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. God's dealt to every man the measure of faith. See, I've had some people say, well, before you're born again, you don't even have faith to do anything. That's not true. God put it in man. Every man can exercise faith to receive Jesus because he says he dealt to every man. Every man means everybody. The measure of faith. So, we all, each person, can, op can use our faith. That's why some people try to say that, well, you, can't, you don't have faith to receive Jesus unless God gives it to you <clears throat> as far as some special thing. No, he's given every man the ability to receive him because he says, whosoever will, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whosoever will confess Jesus as Lord and, and confess and receive him as their personal Lord and Savior, they're going to be born again. So everybody can operate in faith, and God has given us the measure of faith. In fact, remember, this is something that we're told we're to walk by. It would be totally unjust of God to say, you're supposed to walk by faith now if you didn't have it to, in order to walk by it. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Therefore, you've got to understand, you have the faith of Jesus Christ. Faith is a spirit. It is a spirit of faith which you have. Now let's talk further about what this faith is. Faith, the spirit of faith, operates in the realm of the spirit, and when it is put into operation, it also functions according to the law of faith. There is a law of faith that operates as well. <coughs> you have a spirit of faith, you function in the realm of the spirit, you put the law of faith, there's laws of the spirit that operate out in the world of the spirit, and one of them is the law of faith. We see this referred to in Romans 3.27 where it says, Where is boasting then? Is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Because it's by the law of faith that we are justified, not by the deeds of the law. We now, through the law of faith, have come into relationship with him, acting upon that. Now, a law is that which works every time when you put it into operation. It's the way something works. So, our spirit of faith activates the law of faith, one of God's laws, which is going to bring forth the things that he's purposed for us in the manifestation in the realm of the spirit. Because remember, we operate in the realm of the spirit. And you must understand that when you came into Jesus Christ, the law of the spirit came into manifestation in your life, because you're now in Christ Jesus. And it says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made you free, made me free from the law of sin and death. There's a law that works out there, the law of sin and death that works out there in the world. But there's also a law of the spirit of life. And part of that, operation of that, is through the law of faith. So you have a general spirit of faith, and then you have the operation of that spirit of faith putting into operation the law of faith. Now, faith operates in the realm of the spirit, but it also has effects in the realm of the natural because we see, for instance, when he said, your faith has made you whole, what did it do? It caused them to be healed. So faith, which operates in the spirit, 
will have effect to produce the promises of God in the natural realm. Another thing we need to realize, faith is of the Spirit. It has nothing to do with your feelings. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we find an interesting statement. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is bringing what is hoped for into being, and it is dealing with things that are not seen. Things that are not seen are in the unseen realm, the realm of the Spirit. So faith, again, is a spirit dealing with things in the Spirit. And it's dealing with, bringing into me, me, being uh, the things that you hope for. And the word hope is a word, el piso, which means hope or a confident expectancy. Now, hope is of the soul. It is important that we realize. Over in Hebrews chapter 6, we'll run over and take a look off scripture on that, where it talks about how the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Hope is of the soul. We must also understand, as it says over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 8, it talks about faith and hope. It says, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Hope is of the soulish realm, and it's like the helmet which is over our head. Of course, that's where our mind is, and the soulish realm operating through that. So hope is that which is of the soulish realm through the word in our mind. But faith is what is going to bring that into being because that is of the Spirit. Now let's go back over to Hebrews chapter 11 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance. This particular word, substance, is a Greek word, hypostasis. This particular word, stasis means stand and hypo means under. It refers some, to something that is a standing under. But actually, when you look back, and I've studied this out in lexicons, in Greek lexicons, uh, especially referring to Greek literature, and other Greek writings where this particular word was used. It refers to that which has actual existence, also that which has real being, with the under, under, underlying reality or realization of something. That's what it means when it's a standing under, a reality, an underlying reality of something. Faith is the under, uh, underlying reality of the things that are hoped for. What essentially this is saying. Because faith, which is of the Spirit, is going, is the underlying reality of all the things you hope for from the Word in you, that it'll come into being. Because faith contacts the realm of the Spirit that brings these things into being. In fact, everything is coming from the Spirit first before it's coming into the natural. Life is spiritual. Remember, God spoke words which were spiritual words with His faith, and then light came. Light be and light Light be said and light was. He spoke things into being through his faith. In fact, we even see it in verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed or they were brought into being by the spoken word, rhema, the spoken word of God, so that things which are seen, all the things in the natural, were not made of things which do appear. What were they made of? Of things which do not appear, which means the things in the realm of the spirit made all the things in the natural. Well, what's of the Spirit? That which is of faith, the Spirit of faith, operating in the Spirit, brought all these things into being. God used His Spirit of faith to bring things into being. That's exactly what you and I are going to do. And so, it is the underlying reality of the things that are hoped for. And then when it says the evidence of things not seen, this particular word is a word Elangos, and this particular word, it refers to a proof, which is good, but also when I looked this up, in the Greek culture, this word was used for a testing, for a purpose of proving something, where they would test to prove that something was really true, the reality of it, or the proving that it was so, or the verification of it. So it refers to a proof, or a verification, or a certainty of the reality of something. <coughs> So what this is talking about is that faith is the underlying, standing under, reality of things that are hoped for. 
and the proof, verification, and certainty of things not seen. You see, when you're functioning in faith, you know that all your hopes are going to come into being. And you also know that all the things that are not seen, that are the promises of God, are going to be brought into the seen realm because you operate in faith. And that also means that you can deal successfully against all the unseen evil spirits that are arrayed against you as well. Because life is spiritual, remember, and our enemy is a spirit as well. Another thing we need to point out is that faith is not a feeling. Many people say, well, I don't feel like I have faith. It has nothing to do with feelings. It is not of the soulish realm. It is of the realm of the spirit. So you can never gauge whether you have faith by your feelings or by some, you know, something that you, in the natural that you discern. You don't feel faith. Faith deals with the unseen realm, and it is operating in that realm, so it has nothing to do with the senses. Remember, we walk by faith, not by sight or the senses. 2 Corinthians 4.18 even says, While we look not at the things that are seen, we don't focus on the things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, meaning they're only for a season, but the things which are not seen are eternal, we're tapping into the eternal things that are already set in the realm of the Spirit, which governs everything in the universe. So that's why we got to function by faith. Now, we have a general spirit of faith, the same spirit of faith. Does that mean I have faith for every promise? No. Because you have a general spirit of faith doesn't mean you have specific faith. You have to get specific faith and how do you get specific faith? For instance, let's say I got born again and I just I, I received Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I now have received salvation, eternal life. I have a relationship with Him. Now, does that mean that I automatically have faith for healing or faith for all these promises to come to pass? No. You have a general spirit of faith, but you need to get specific faith, and there is a difference. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. As we hear God's word, it's going to produce specific faith. Remember, we have a general spirit of faith, and we also get specific faith, and that is an important point. Many people fail to realize that faith is going to be received specifically through the word on area after area. For instance, if you've heard the word on healing, it's going to produce faith for healing. But maybe you never heard the word on deliverance, you won't have faith for deliverance. You're only going to have faith for that which you have heard that you're going to act upon. Of course, to put it and bring it in operation. So there is a very important you understand that you have a general spirit of faith when you're born again, but you get specific faith by hearing the word on area after area after area. That's why we've got to hear the word in depth on all these different areas so we understand what the Word says, so we have faith for those promises or to walk in the ways of the Lord. Here's a very important scripture that really illustrates this and shows you this, because when you hear the Word, what does it produce? Faith, doesn't it? In fact, by the way, let's go back over to 1 Thessalonians for a moment. We looked at this, but just want to point something out. <laughs> when faith comes, specifically, the word is coming into you here. Where does it get to? It gets into your heart. The word in your heart produces faith, and the word in your mind produces hope. There's a difference. The word is actually written in two places. We'll look at this scripture first. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Helmet covers the head. Hope is of the soul realm. Breastplate covers the heart. Faith and love are of the heart. Remember what it says in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. What happens when the word comes to you? The covenant in this day that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, is I will put my laws into their mind. What does that produce? Hope and I will write them in their hearts. That produces faith. We see the reverse said in 10.16 of Hebrews. 
Hebrews 10, 16 says, This is the covenant that I'll make with the mouth of those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So God says that he puts and writes his laws into your mind, and he puts and writes his laws into your heart. In your mind, it produces hope, which is of the soul. This is why you've got to have the word in your mind. At the same time, that doesn't mean that you have faith, specifically. The word has to be in your heart. Now remember what the devil does. Once a person has heard the word, we have an enemy that is coming against us. And it talks about here in Luke 8, 12, those are the wayside, by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh the word out of their hearts. Didn't say he took it out of their mind. He took it out of their heart. Because that's where faith is going to be released to bring your hopes into being. The word written in your mind, remember, produces hope. The word written in your heart produces faith, specifically. Lest they should believe and be saved, he comes to take the word out of their heart. Now, you may still know something in your mind. Well, yeah, I know what the word says about healing. But if it got taken out of your heart, you're not going to have any means to put your faith in operation to bring that into being. You may know it mentally, but that doesn't mean that you have faith in your heart if the devil has taken it out. And how does he take it out of your heart? If you have turned away from it, fallen away from it, from temptation, or you've not continued in it and done it to bring forth the fruit. If there's not fruit of it, then he's been able to take that word out. Now, another thing that's very important is what's said over here in Hebrews chapter 4. In fact, first of all, Hebrews 4, 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. God wants us to enter into every promise, doesn't he? And that's the rest. That's the spiritual rest that we enter into now, as Jesus is our rest, and we enter into sp the spiritual rest of possessing all the promises that belong to us, and we do this through, our, through the word of God that gives us the promises, and through our faith that brings those promises into being. Now the next verse is very revealing. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Now what happens when you hear the word? It gets in your heart immediately, and also will get into your mind. So the word preached put faith specifically in their heart. Why did it not profit them or be an advantage to them? not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. What are we talking about here? Not being wi mixed with their general spirit of faith in them that heard it. There is a difference between the spirit of faith, which is your general spirit of faith, and having specific faith, which is the, what comes from the Word of God, of the Word in your heart. If the devil takes the word out of your heart, you don't have faith in that area any longer. You still have a general spirit of faith. You got it from the day you're born again, and that's not going to leave you. You know, you have the spirit of Jesus Christ in you. You have a general spirit of faith that you're to live by and walk by. But what do we need to do with the word that's been sown in us? He says you've got to mix what you heard with your faith in them that heard it. How do I mix my spirit of faith with what I heard that produced specific faith by doing what it says and acting upon it. Let's give an example. You hear the word on deliverance, to cast out demons. You got the word in your mind producing hope. I have confident expectancy what God will do. You got the word in your heart that produced faith for deliverance, but will that faith for deliverance put, bring forth the word profiting you, producing the results of the deliverance in your life automatically. No. What do you have to do? You've got to mix your faith with what you heard. And what faith are we talking about? Your general spirit of faith that you put in operation by doing what the word says. And let's take you over to a scripture that shows you what you're doing with your general spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, We having the same spirit of faith, we saw this before, this is what we got when we're born again, the spirit of faith, according as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. 
We believe and therefore speak. What is this saying? This is what you do with your spirit of faith to put it in operation. Now, what are we believing? We're believing the word that came into our heart, right? That produced what? Faith. So we believe the word in our heart that we heard, and then we speak it forth, which is one of the ways that you put it in operation to release it so that your faith will work for you. And that is very important. This brings us to the next thing that we need to cover. <clears throat> so what we've said thus far is you have a general spirit of faith when you're born again. You get specific faith in area after area after area as you hear the word. The devil will come against you for the word's sake, trying to get it out of your heart so you do not maintain faith, even though you might know it in your mind. And you are to, the word doesn't automatically profit you unless you mix the word that you heard with your faith, your spirit of faith, by doing what it says or acting upon it, or in this case, as we saw there, not only believing it, but speaking it to release it to come into being. Another thing that we must realize is that faith has been given you as your servant. You live by this spirit of faith. It is to serve you. In Luke chapter 17, we even see, well, verse 5, first of all, we'll cover this, where the apostles said to the Lord, increase, or this really means add, add to our faith or increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted the sea, and it should obey you. <laughs> you see, they understood they had faith. But they said, hey, we need to add to our faith. And he told them, what are you going to do to increase or add to your faith or get your faith to develop? You've got to put it in operation. So what are you doing it with? Your spirit of faith. And so what is your spirit of faith? It is your servant to serve you to do things in order to see God's word produce results in your life. He goes on, and this is continuing. They hadn't changed the subject. Still talking about faith. It says, which of you, he brings this out, how you, this is how you're going to get your faith uh, added, increased, and working for you. Which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he's come from the field, go and sit down to meet? If you've got a servant and he's serving you, do you say, hey, go down and rest, you don't have to do anything? No. If you're a servant, you're paying your servant, what do you do? Your servant's got to go out and serve you and work for you, right? You put your servant to work. He doesn't sit around. You see, he's bringing this in the fact, in the midst, Jesus is still talking, of talking here. He didn't change subjects. He's still talking about your faith. Your faith is your servant that's been given to you. Because remember, that's what you live by. That's what you walk by. That's what you function by. That's everything you do is with your faith your spirit of faith. He says, Will not rather say to him, Make ready where thy sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Your spirit of faith is to serve you. It's been given to you to serve you. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not, or I think not. Otherwise, he's supposed to do what he's supposed to do because he's your servant. He's going to automatically do it when you put him to operation. So likewise, ye, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants, we've done that, which is our duty to do. So what you've got to realize is your faith is your servant, that you put in operation as you're serving the Lord and obeying him to do all the things that he wants you to do. And your faith, as you put it into operation, serving you, the spirit, general spirit of faith, is going to grow. And it's going to grow and become strong. Do we pray for our faith to become strong? No. We apply our faith and use our faith to become strong. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 says, We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it's meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Your faith is to grow. It is to grow exceedingly and increase greatly. Let's go back over to that Luke 17 for a moment. So you see again the first thing that he said. You got this servant, your spirit of faith, and he says, I want to add, increase our faith. How do you cause your faith to grow? Put it in operation. Apply it. Do something with it. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you say to the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root. In other words, it's going to grow because you apply your faith. 
Therefore, do I need, quote, more faith? No, I already got the, the measure of faith. I already got the same spirit of faith. What do I need to get? Of course, I need to get specific faith through the Word, but I need to apply my faith and work my faith, essentially, so it will grow, so it will develop, so it will become strong. That's why we've got to put our faith in operation. Your faith is going to grow exceedingly, as it says, and it's going to develop. Remember what we saw in Hebrews, where it talks about in chapter 12, in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, which means one who develops, develops and perfects our faith. Your faith is to get developed. It is to grow strong. And you'll see some scriptures about how uh, Abraham later will see how he grew strong in faith when we get to that. You're going to grow strong in faith through the application of it. In some ways, it's kind of like having a muscle and developing your muscle strength. When you were born, you got all these muscles. Just like when you were born spiritually, you got the spirit of faith, in a sense. Now, do I need more muscles? No, I already got the muscles. Do I need more faith? No. But what do I need to do with my muscles? I need to develop them. What do you need to do with your faith? You need to develop it. You need to put it in operation so it increases and grows strong. As I use and develop and put into operation my muscles, they will grow strong. In like manner, as you put your faith in operation and you work your faith, it will grow strong. You see, faith is something that you're going to work. We see this in 2 Thessalonians 1.11, where Paul makes this statement. He says, Wherefore always we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. The work of faith. That means you're going to work your faith. Just because you have the word in you that produces specific faith and you have a general spirit of faith doesn't mean it's doing anything for you. You've got to work your faith. Now remember, you have a general spirit of faith, then you get specific faith through hearing the word, but still that doesn't mean just because you've got specific faith that it's automatically working for you to produce. You've got to work your faith. You've got to put this faith in operation. You've got to release this faith. You've got to make this faith that's your servant, your spirit of faith, serve you to bring those things that are to be brought into manifestation in your life come forth through the application of your faith. Another thing we must realize, as we already mentioned, your faith is going to be released. It's going to be put into operation. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, We have in the same spirit of faith as believed, as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. We saw that. So we're going to speak to release it. We see the same thing brought over in Romans in chapter 10. Here in verse 8, it says, What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And we ask the question, where is faith? Faith is to be in two places. It's going to be in your heart. It's also going to be in your mouth. Because your mouth is going to speak forth and release that which is out of your heart. The word of faith which we preach. And he goes on and says, If you will confess with your mouth, or you say with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, that's the word in your heart, you shall be saved. Someone tells you Jesus has been raised from the dead and he's the Savior and you need to receive him. If you believe that word that was sown in you and then you act upon it by confessing him as your Lord and Savior, receiving him, what happens? Then you're going to get saved. For with the heart man believes on the righteous. Not talking about with your mind, but with the heart. And the heart is on the inside of you, the hidden man of the heart. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. By the way, many people have taught out there that the spirit and the heart are the same. They are not. The spirit is who you are. You're made of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. The heart is separate from it. The reason you know this is because your spirit, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ, does it have any evil in it? No. Could there ever be any evil in the spirit of Christ? No. But can you have evil in your heart? Yes. Let's give you one quick example. Over in Mark, chapter 11, verse 23. This shows you how you can have evil in your heart. 
It says you shall not doubt in your heart. That means you can have something evil come into your heart. Look at another scripture, just an example of this. Over in Hebrews chapter 3, over here in verse 12. Take heed, brother, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. You can have evil in your heart. You can have evil in your heart even though you have the Spirit of Christ in you. You've got the Spirit of Jesus Christ in you, but so your spirit and your heart are not the same. It is linked to your heart, is, the heart is linked to your spirit, and it's also linked to your faculties because when you hear through your ears, it, the word gets into your heart, so it can come in from your faculties. But also, it's linked to your spirit because it's going to release spiritual power. Your spirit of faith is put into operation through the word that you believe in your heart, and then you speak it forth with your mouth. So it has a link to the spirit and also a link to the soul or the exterior, the, the natural realm. This is why your heart is so important. In fact, you've got to realize, when you got born again, not only did you get a brand new spirit on the inside of you, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 says, A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Those are two different things. You got a new heart, and you got a new spirit when you got born again. The old spirit's gone, and the, the old heart is gone. Your spirit, of course, is the spirit of Jesus Christ, right with God, and you receive the Holy Spirit. He comes and dwells in your spirit. No evil's ever in your spirit. But you can have evil in your heart. That's why we see that you are told in Proverbs chapter 4, in verse 23, keep which means to guard your heart with all diligence. You've got to guard what's coming into your heart. Your heart is to have the Word in it, producing specific faith that you put into operation with your general spirit of faith as you speak forth, releasing that, to see the promises come into manifestation. That's why we've got to guard our heart. Very important. In fact, your words, remember, are releasing that which is coming out of the inside of you, out of your heart. This is also, if you've got evil in your heart, it's going to come out of your mouth, won't it? We've got to guard that. We see a statement over here in Matthew 12, 37. He says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And this is in response to, back in verse 34, where it says, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Whatever's in your heart in abundance is what's to come out of your mouth. That's why you've got to guard your heart. What do you want? Do you want anything that's contrary to the Word to come into your heart? No. That's why, how can you listen to any of these TV programs or movies or any of this garbage out there? You don't want to hear, see any of that coming into you. It is sowing that in your heart because it gets in there. Every, if the word gets into your heart when you hear it, what do you think is coming into your heart when you hear something negative? It's getting in there. Don't think, oh, it's not getting in there. Oh, yes, it is. It's coming in. That's why we've got to guard our heart. heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure, the word treasure means where you collect and laid some, lay something up, like deposit. Uh, the guy who's deposited the good things in his heart. Your, your heart is to be depositing good things. He's going to bring forth good things. But the evil man, out of the evil treasure or deposit where he has laid things, collected them up, is going to bring forth evil things. That's why it's of a necessity that we guard our heart. And again, he says, every idle word that men shall speak, you'll give account thereof in the day of judgment. See, you've got to also understand, the words you speak are affecting you in your heart. It's not just what you hear from people speaking on the outside. Because when you speak, who's hearing you? You are hearing you too, aren't you? And where are you hearing you? On the inside of you, not just on the outside. Why do you hear your voice when you speak normally, it sounds one way, and then you hear your voice on a tape recorder and it sounds different? Because you are hearing what you're speaking from within and without, more, more so because it's you. Outside, you're more predominantly hearing with your ear. That's why it sounds a little bit different. Because everything you speak is being registered in your heart. That's why we've got to watch the words we speak. You know, you can curse yourself. 
You can speak negative things. That's why you want to watch what you say. Don't speak negative words about yourself. That's the devil trying to trick us to, in order to sow evil things into our heart. You speak all kinds of words of depression and negativism and all this stuff, what's going to be in you? All this depression and negative, what's going to come out of you? More negative and depression. What's going to produce in you? Negativism and depression and sadness and sorrow and all these things. That's why you want to guard your mouth because your mouth is sowing things in your heart. And then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. So it's very important that we guard our heart. <clears throat> now, another thing that's very important. We talked about the fact that you can have faith. Generally, you have your spirit of faith, and you can get specific faith through the word in your heart. But that doesn't mean it's doing anything for you. You have to release it or put it into operation. And we see over in James chapter 2, in verse 14, something that said, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and has not works, can faith save him? He's got faith. How did he get it? Through the word that came to him. It's a specific faith we're talking about. But he doesn't work or act upon the word that he heard that produced faith within him. It, can his faith save him if he doesn't act upon it or do it? No, it won't produce. And he brings this, he says, if I see a brother or sister be naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, depart from me, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things that are needful for the body, what does it profit? It doesn't profit a bit. You need, there needs to be some action to minister to that particular situation. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. This means that having faith is one thing, seeing it produce for you is another thing. Having faith alone is dead in the sense that it's not bringing forth any life or production out of you. You've got to put it in operation. Faith has the means to bring it into being, kind of like the seed. The seed has the power within itself just like the Word has the power, but you've got to get the Word in the place where it can produce, which is in your heart, just like the seed in the ground. You put the seed in the ground, <coughs> now it's in a position there where it can begin to do something. Your faith has to have some corresponding works or actions in order to produce, just carrying that thing around, but not doing something or put it in a position where it can produce. It's not going to work for you. Your faith needs to be acted upon. He goes on, he says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. That shows you, tells you something. Faith is seen and shown forth by action and by words. Example. Get back to the area about the deliverance. We hear the word on deliverance. We believe the word on deliverance. We believe that if we cast out demons, hey, the demons will come out of us. Praise God, I'm all excited about it. Is it working for me? Is it doing anything for me? No, not unless I act on it and start doing what it says. It's inoperative, it's alone, it's not producing for me, even though I believe that word. I've got to put that word in operation or do something where it can work, which of course is acting upon it in that example. Your faith is shown by your works. He goes on and says, here's what about the believing. Thou believest there's one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. Because you believe doesn't get anything happening. That's where many people say, well, I'm believing God. You say, that's wonderful that you're believing God, but what are you doing? Or what are you speaking? Or what are you acting upon? What are you putting in operation to see God produce that? Well, I'm just believing God. Well, that's just in your, in your heart. I'm believing but where is your action and your release of faith and the operation of your faith? I'm believing I'm going to be delivered from all these demons, but you're not casting them out. I believe I'm going to be healed, but you're not coming boldly to the throne of grace and taking hold of his healing power to flow into your body. It's not going to happen unless you do something that puts your faith in operation. Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? It goes, goes on and says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he'd offered Isaac his son upon the altar? You see, he had to go and do something, didn't he? 
he had to obey. Seeing how faith wrought with his works, by works was faith made perfect. The scripture was fulfilled, so that shows you that, that by works your faith was made perfect or be complete and produce results. It's going to come forth and bring forth the desired result. The scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God, it was imputed to unto him for righteousness, he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. She did something to show forth that she believed by hiding them and getting rid of the other ones, sending them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That tells you something. If our body does not have the spirit in it, it's lifeless. It can do nothing. You can have faith, but if you don't have corresponding actions, your faith is lifeless. That means you have a general spirit of faith that's to serve you, and if you don't get the word in you, you're not going to be doing anything with it. It's just going to be sitting there. Even if you get the word in you producing specific faith in your heart, it still is automatic, not automatically working for you unless you put it into operation and act upon the word and do what it says. Very important. So we must realize we have a spirit of faith, generally. We get specific faith from the word in our heart and we get the hope in our mind as the words written in our heart and mind. We must act on the word or put it in operation or speak it, that word that produced specific faith in our heart to release it to see it come into manifestation. For instance, you have a mountain in front of you, I believe that mountain will be removed because I got faith that I can speak to that mountain and it'll happen. It'll be removed. Great, you got faith. Is it moving? No, unless you start speaking. You got to put that faith in operation. Just another example of this. And we also must do what the Word says. God says, draw an eye to me, I'll draw an eye to you. You can say, I believe that word. If I draw an eye to God, God will draw an eye to me. That's wonderful. I'm waiting for God to draw an eye to me. You'll be waiting forever. If you draw an eye to him, your action, then he'll draw an eye to you. Otherwise, we've got to do with the word. That's why it says throughout the word, if you do such and such, then I'll do such and such. The doing is our faith putting, putting put in operation. Remember, your faith must be, your general spirit of faith must be mixed with the specific faith from the word preached in order to profit you. Very important. Now, Let's go over and look at, before we close for this morning, Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, we see it talks about Abraham, and it speaks here that Abraham operated in the God kind of faith. And it talks about how we walk in the steps of that faith of our Ab father Abraham. He operated in the real faith. And down in verse 17, we begin to see some important principles that are shown, that's going to show how faith will work for you. Romans 4, 17. As it's written, I've made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. What is he going to, what's our faith going to do? It's going to call those things, as the King James says, be not as though they were. We've already pointed out to you, if you were here in the past, that the word were is a mistake. It actually is the word to be. It's the same word. This word be, being, is the exact same word here, being, when I put the cursor over it. Young's literal corrects the error where he brings it out. Who is quickening the dead is calling the things that be not as being. Be not as being. Not as though it was already done. Be not as being. What this means is you're going to call, and by the way, the word call is in the present tense, because when you put faith in operation, you're going to continue to put it in operation until you see the desired results. Faith is continually to be applied, your general spirit of faith, until the promise is manifested. Once the promise is manifested, you don't need your faith anymore. It's come into manifestation. You use it for something else. Present tense, continuous repeated action. So this means is calling 
as Young's brings out, is calling the things which are not being as being. In other words, I'm going to speak into being the things that are not being to bring them into being. Not as though they already were done, but to bring them into being. The reason why this is important is because the, the teaching has gone forth in the body of Christ, call those things as though they were already done. Call those things not happening as though they were already done because of misunderstanding what this verse is talking about. And that's also where they've given rise to the pray one time, speak to the mountain one time, believe one time, count it done, and that's it. When instead, it says to continually, <clears throat> continually call those things which are not being as being, present tense, to bring them into being. So that's one thing. As we sp we're speaking to a mountain, in fact, we'll come back over here in a moment. Let's go over to Mark. We gave that example in Mark 11, 23, where we're supposed to use our faith to move a mountain. Be thou removed, you say, the, say to the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart. That's why you gotta guard your heart, so you don't doubt in your heart. But shall believe, he's believing in his heart, that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Of course, many have taught out there, you speak one time to the mountain and believe that the mountain is removed. They say, if you speak more than one time to the mountain, then you must not have believed that it was removed the first time. You didn't believe, so you must not have been in faith. That is an erroneous understanding of faith. Faith is not a point of being where I came to faith and automatically then everything is done. Faith is something that you have and that you continually release and put into operation until you see the promise come to pass or the mountain be removed. How can we know that that's true? because believe those things which he saith. The word saith happens to be in the present tense. The present tense denotes continuous, repeated action. In other words, it says, believe those things which he says and continues to say shall come to pass. But what is he saying and continuing to say? To the mountain, he's saying, be thou removed, be thou removed, be thou removed and cast in the sea. He continues to speak that. You'll have whatever you say. It's also true in the prayer of faith. Mark 11, 24, whatsoever things, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. Unfortunately, many people have thought that they've kind of interpreted this, believe you received and you'll have it. But it didn't say believe you received, which would be like one time prayer. Instead, it says believe you receive. It's interesting that when you look up every one of these words in the Greek, you find out there's a present tense verb, as we see the first one. The second one, pray, is also a present tense verb, which means continuous, repeated action. Believe, also present tense verb, continuous, repeated action. Receive, the one that many people have kind of interpreted was received, thinking that, that, but again, it's present tense, present tense verb meaning the prayer of faith is to be continuous and repeated until you see the results. So faith is something that you have as a general spirit of faith, and you get specific faith through the Word, and then you apply your faith continuously by working your faith, or speaking forth in line with your faith, or praying, taking hold of that continuously with your faith until you see the result manifested in your life. That's why it says we call those things that are not being as being continually until they come into being, until they're manifest. Now let's go to the next point in verse 18 of Romans 4. Who against hope believed in hope. Hope is of the soul. That's the word in the area of your mind. He believed in hope against any hope. Against hope was because in the natural, remember, he was about 100 years old. In fact, it even says so in the next verse. Uh, down here it says, he considered not his own body now dead, was about 100 years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. In the natural, there was no reason to have hope. Hope is not based on the circumstance. Hope is not based on what's going on physically in your body. Hope is not based on anything in the natural realm. Hope is based on the word. 
which is spiritual law. In fact, what produces hope? We'll come back here in a second, but we need to look at this. What produces hope in a person's life? Romans 15, 4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. What produced the hope? The Scriptures, the source of the hope. So since the Word is the hope, we go back over there, against any reason for hope, he believed in hope. Now, what was his basis for being able to believe in hope? He just couldn't decide, well, I'm just going to believe. No, he had to have something to be a basis for. It goes on, says that he might become the father of many nations. Well, where did he get that idea? Be according, to, according to that that was spoken, so shall thy seed be. God spoke that word to him. Therefore, he had the word of God that was spoken, the promise. That's what produced hope. So the basis for hope is the scripture, the promise of God which is your hope, your confident expectancy, and that's the word in your mind. But remember, the word's also written in your heart, which has produced faith. That's why the word is in two places, in a sense. It's in your heart and in also in the, the faith. Is, the word's in two places, heart and mind, producing faith and hope. But faith is in two places, which is your heart and your mouth. Not in your mind. Faith is not of the mind. Hope's of the mind. Are you with me on that? Faith is two places. Where? It's said in your heart and in your mouth. But the word is in two places. Where? In your heart, producing faith, and in your mind, producing hope. Now, really, I guess you'd say three places. It's also going to be in your mouth. So really, the word's in three places. One of them is producing hope. Two of them, it's going to be involved in faith working. But notice his source of hope was the Word. When you have the Scripture promise, you have hope. Also, the Word in your heart means you have faith, specific now. And you've got a general spirit of faith. And you are to bring that thing into being with your faith that's your servant that is to bring those things into being from the realm of the Spirit. Romans 4.19 says, Now not being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Notice that. You are weak in faith if you consider the natural realm. If you look at your circumstances, you're weak in faith. I got this in my body. This is what you're considering. You're weak in faith. I got this problem in my mind. If you're considering that, as far as seeing a change, you're weak in faith. What are we, we, sure, we have these problems in us, but what's, what are we going to focus on? We're going to focus on the promise, the Word, because that's how we're going to get strong in faith. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. You cannot stagger at the promise of God through any kind of unbelief. Unbelief has to be resisted. How? By keeping the Word before you. If you get, let something come in that's contrary to that, well, I don't know if I'll get healed. Ah, uh, you just let unbelief come in. Well, maybe it won't work. You just let unbelief come in, or doubt, or, you know, or I don't know if it'll work, and I'm, I'm kind of tossed to, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. You're wavering, see? But what did he do? He was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Or he was strengthened, and this word doesn't mean the fact that it just came all of a sudden, it just, you know, suddenly here. He was strong, I'm going to talk about this, and dunamo. This meant passively it was produced. He was strong in faith or strengthened. How? Having given glory to God. He continued to keep his eyes on the Lord, giving glory to him, and he maintained a strength in faith because he didn't stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. Otherwise, where was his eyes? On the Word, the promise. And he continued to call those things not being as being. He continued in hope because his, eye, his mind was on it. And he continued to speak forth and declare those things to release it. And that's how he got strong in faith, giving glory to God. 
and being fully persuaded that what he'd promised he was able also to perform. God wants you to be fully persuaded that what he's promised he's able or has the power to perform it. Fully persuaded means no doubt, no wondering, no, I don't know if I'm on or off today. No, we're always on, we know. You see, that's why faith really is coming to the point of knowing what God will do. When you are in faith, you know you have a general spirit of faith because you know what the scripture says. You heard the word and you know the words written in your heart and in your mind. You know that you have specific faith. You know that you have hope because you have this promise that your eyes are upon. Against any reason for it, you are going to believe in the confident expectancy hope in your mind because you know what the Word says is the truth. And it comes down to knowing that God's Word is the truth and you're not going to let anything in. You cannot let anything come in that is going to get you to not know what God's going to will do. See, when you believe, you know what's going to happen. For instance, in the area of deliverance, it says you begin to cast out the demons. Do I know what's going to happen? Or am I hopeful maybe something will happen? In a kind of way of thinking, well, I'm not sure. Or am I, am I kind of wishy-washy about this? No. Or am I, I'm just going to believe that something hopefully will happen? Well, in a sense, yes, but it's not a matter of so much believing, it's a matter of knowing. When I act on the Word, I know it's going to happen. When you pray to receive the Holy Spirit, how do you know it's going to happen? Because you know that He's going to perform His Word. See, you're at the point of faith when you believe, the, if you believe it, you know it's going to happen. If someone tells you, if you do such and such, A, then B will happen. If you believe that and you act upon it, it's because you know the fact that, hey, when I do that, I know that that's going to work. And you do it. So believing is also going to be shown by the fact that you know what God will do because you know he performs his word. You know what's going to happen in the realm of the spirit. So really, come, people say, well, I need to come to a place of faith. You've got to realize you've got a general spirit of faith, one. Two, you get specific faith through the word in you. You guard your heart so you don't let anything come in. You keep the word before you in your mind so you maintain hope because faith is going, going to the underlying rea realization of your hope what you hope for, it's going to bring it into being. You know that your faith, which is a spirit of faith, is going to tap into the unseen realm to bring into being that which you have hope for because you got this promise. And you're going to realize, you're going to see that realization of it because you're going to put your faith in operation. You're going to work your faith. You're going to speak your faith. You're going to do the word. You're going to act upon it. And you know it's going to happen because the word says it. And if God says he's going to do it, I believe that and I know he's going to do it. It's kind of like where it talks about over in, in uh, believing really has a knowing aspect to it. Remember over in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, where it says, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. We need to know it and believe it. You believe it and you know it. It kind of goes hand in hand. I believe what God do it and I, what it says, says and I know he's going to do it. I believe that he's my healer and I know that he's going to heal me because if he did, he's no respecter of persons. If he healed one person, he'll heal everybody. If he healed me of a headache once, he'll heal me of this other thing later. If he delivered me from one pain, he'll deliver me from all the pains when I cast out the demons. If he answered one prayer, then, and if I pray the word on another thing, he'll respond and make that good, of course, as well. So Abraham's faith showed forth that he called things that were not being as being to bring him into being. Against any reason for hope, he believed in hope because he had the scripture, the basis for hope. He didn't consider the natural realm, otherwise you get weak in faith. It's not like we're not observing it. We're aware that it's there. We just don't consider it. Sure, I got this pain in my body. I understand it's there, but I'm not going to consider that. I'm considering what God says and what's in the realm of the spirit, my faith, put in operation to deal with this. And especially if it's from an evil spirit, I know that I can cast this thing out and get rid of it. 
or I can take hold of the healing power of God. He staggered not the promise of God, settled on the word, strong in faith because he continued to give glory to God, showing the fact that we know what God's going to do. And he was fully persuaded that what God was able to perform. And what was he doing? He's working his faith. As you put your faith in operation and work your faith, then you're going to see the results. We've looked at some things that we've introduced this today. It's important that you understand the fact that faith is important, that it is one of the mysteries. There's only one faith. You're either in it or not. That we are to strive together for the faith of the gospel and early and earnestly contend for the true faith that was delivered to the saints. It is something that's to abide in us. It is something that God's looking for. In fact, when he comes back, he's going to say, am I going to find faith on the earth? Am I going to find people that are doing my word and walking in it? And we see the fact that we have the faith of Jesus Christ. We got it when we're born again. A general spirit of faith. He's the author of it. It's like precious faith. It's the measure of faith. It is what we walk by. It is that which is of the spirit. If someone says, what is faith? It is a spirit. It is a spirit of faith, which you put into operation through the word. Specifically, it's you, have, you get specific faith through hearing the word written in your heart. Then you must act upon that in order to put it into operation to see the results of it. Your faith is your servant, your general spirit of faith. Make them work for you. That's what you live by. That's what you walk by. That's what you do everything by. Everything that we do is with our faith. Serve. It's to serve you. Walk it. Do it. Put it in operation. And you'll see it all come into manifestation. You see all the promises. Your faith will produce every promise in your life. But we've got to work our faith with power. That's why I prayed for them that the work of faith would be done with power. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the revelation of faith. I thank you that I have a general spirit of faith when I was born again. I got the same spirit of faith. And I also get specific faith through the word. The word written in my heart produces faith. The word written in my mind produces hope. I am going to work my faith by speaking the word or acting upon the word, or doing what it says, to release my faith, to work my faith, so that it comes into fruition and produces the results. I thank you, Lord. Faith always deals with the unseen realm, and it is going to grow exceedingly. As my servant, I put it into operation. As I continue to use it, it will develop and grow strong. I thank you, Lord. I'm going to continue to speak, calling those things not being, to bring them into being. I will always believe in hope, having the scripture promise. I will not consider the natural realm. I will not stagger at the promise of God. But I will continue to give glory to God. And I'll grow strong in faith. And I'll be fully persuaded that what God is, says, He's able to perform. Thank you, Lord. I am always going to operate in faith. And I am going to see every promise come into manifestation in my life. Thank you for the faith of Jesus. And I'll get specific faith as I hear the word on area after area. And I'll work it as I do the word in area after area, and I'll see all the promises come into manifestation in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I trust this has helped you. It's really kind of broken down about faith. So many people, they fa faith, they just think it's just believing God, or I'm just believing for such and such, failing to understand what they already got, and failing to understand what they need to do with what they got, mm -hmm. and how they need to guard their heart so that the word doesn't get taken out and they don't have faith anymore, even though they know something in their mind. Many people know it in their mind, but they don't have faith in their heart because they let the devil take the word out because they didn't do it. They got into doubt or unbelief. So, as we understand all these things, 
We're going to continue on this tonight. We've got lots to talk about. We've got many, many scriptures throughout. We're going to continue on bringing this forth and uh, covering this, this subject very in depth. And I believe it will be a, a blessing to really get us established because, remember, that's one of the three things to us to abide. If you need prayer, I invite you to come forward. Otherwise, God bless. Have a great afternoon. And tonight, we'll be continuing on this subject. You are dismissed. Have a great afternoon. God bless.